I was at first daunted by the invitation to present on a title, Women in Catholicism from Ancient Times to the Present, as if my 15 minutes was really going to give you a sense of all of that. But then I saw the, the actual title, that's the subtitle, Women in uh, Catholicism and Judaism from Ancient Times to the Present, but the, but the title itself was her story. And I said, well, I can do that. I can tell you the way that I tell the story of women in my tradition. Right? And so that's what you have. And we're going to miss a lot of things, um, but I'm hoping that I tell a story that gives us some sense of the tensions and some sense of the possibilities for women in the Catholic tradition. So how do I tell this story? You'll see on your handout that my story begins with Paul's letter to the Christian community in Rome written in the first century. And for Christians, this is the first set of documents, Paul's letters, are the first set of documents that Christians kind of call their own, right? These are the oldest Christian texts that we have, and they're part of Christian sacred scripture. And in this letter to the community at Rome, um, Paul is, uh, is, is talking with the community or writing to the community about how to live as Christians. Right? And he's, he gives a, a description of what it is to live the Christian life. And then, in his closing, he affirms all those people who are doing this and giving their lives to it and, and are leaders in this tiny little church around the Mediterranean world and this particular church, the community in Rome. And he writes in closing, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church, so that you may welcome her in the Lord as it is fitting for the saints and help her in whatever she may require from you, for she has been a benefactor for many, and of myself as well. Greet Prissa and Achaia, who work with me in Christ Jesus and who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Greet also the church in their house. Greet my beloved Epiphanitus, who was the first convert in Asia for Christ. Greet Mary, who has worked very hard among you. All right, so what do we notice? The women among, among this Christian community in Rome are leaders. Sister Phoebe, right? She's a deacon of the church and a benefactor. Prissa risks her neck for Paul's life, and Paul owes her so much. Mary, working hard among the new Christians. So there, in the Christian sacred texts, among the very few documents that we have, among the very oldest writings of this community, women are leaders. They are as important as Paul, and he names them that way. That's the beginning of her story. But history has told it differently, right? These women become marginal figures, not so important. We don't really proclaim them. How many Christians in the group know the story of these women, right? How many Christians around the world know their story as much as they know Paul, right? So, so her story has to look at these um, these traces of women who were part of the earliest Christian community and begin to tell the story there. Right? And her story begins there, but they also reflect then the, the women who would have followed Jesus in the Jesus movement. Right? So with the Christian scriptures, we have Paul's letters, and then, uh, and then the next generation writes down the story of Jesus, and we have those in the Gospels. Right? So there's where we're having the remembrance of Jesus. And when that later community, right, in the first century, tells the story of Jesus, they again tell the story of women among his followers. Right? And so, uh, I don't know that I, I don't have that here, right? But you can turn to the New Testament and you can see women in lots of different places, right? But sometimes history has allowed us to read those texts and gloss over them, right? And not to see the women, women present there. So one of the things that feminist scholarship in the Catholic tradition has done is said, you know what? How do we read the story of women? How do we tell her story? By reading sometimes things that are little bits in the text, right, that we need to open them up in a new way. So for example, um, among my favorites right now are the, are the stories again and again of Jesus um, and teaching those who would follow him about what it is to be a, 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 a follower, right, and what it is to be in relation to one another and to in, be in relation to God. And he brings a child among them, right, and he says, you must become like these. Or he says, right, let the little children come to me, right? So for Christians, that's okay, yeah, Jesus does that all the time. But these children weren't running around on their own, right? And we don't tell the story of the women who would have been there with those children. 
the average women, countless nameless women among the people who came out to hear Jesus as he preached his vision, demonstrating with their presence their commitment to this vision. Women were likely among the people who had their children in tow when they went to hear Jesus preach about the kingdom of God as it came through their village. These mothers were close enough to the inner circle of Jesus' teaching that they were present among the disciples when Jesus passed through the Galilee and stayed in Capernaum. They were at the center of the debate among the disciples about who is the greatest. For when the disciples had argued on the road to Capernaum among themselves, Jesus reminds them when they arrive in the house where they will sit by taking a little child and putting it among them. On the historical evidence, Elizabeth Johnson writes of women in the first century context that, quote, a mother was primarily in charge of the care of small children. Rather than compete with her other workaday obligations, this care was subsumed into the routine of daily tasks, the children being present where the mother was working. We can remember, then, the women who may have anxiously awaited the arrival of the traveling demonstration with Jesus at the lead, waiting for them to arrive in their home. We remember these mothers who, in their multiplicity, followed Jesus while simultaneously fulfilling their expected childcare responsibilities. That's a piece of her story that we can see in the sacred texts of Christianity, but it, that has not been told in my own Catholic tradition. History has erased also those women. So her story begins as women follow the Jesus movement and as women work in the early church as leaders. But Christian feminist historians suggest that as the Christian church developed, it became increasingly accommodating to the Greco-Roman society and the gendered expectations and patriarchal codes. So that we have evidence of women's leadership right, but in the early church, but then we have evidence also of the Christian church's accommodating right, to, these, to these, uh, the, the pa uh, patriarchal broader society. So that we have evidence like the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, which I have included on your sheet, from the second century, where Mary Magdalene is a leader among the apostles. It's a story that was told by some early Christians, right? And we have the evidence in the texts that we can still see the, the text of this gospel that was lost, right? And in that text, we see Peter, among the disciples, saying to Mary, Sister, we know that the Savior loved you more than the rest of women, Tell us the words of the Savior which you remember, which you know, but we do not, nor have we heard them. And Mary answered and said, What is hidden from you I will proclaim to you. And she began to speak these words. And so we have the story from an ancient Christian community where Mary Magdalene has a special teaching from Jesus. But this also right, is erased. By the time that the canon develops, right, we have a, a male-centered leadership within the, within the Christian tradition, and women's leadership is, is uh, uh, I don't know, is, is <laughs> what, however, fill in the blank, right? So suppressed, right? Somebody help me out there, right? So that, so that stories like the Gospel of Mary, a community that remembered uh, women as leaders, is simply not included in the canon, right? So this sense that what becomes authoritative and handed down is his story and her story is erased. Right? So the story of, of women in the Catholic tradition that, that I see from these ancient texts that I think we can trace in various ways throughout is that there are opportunities for women's leadership and examples of women's leadership and Christian empowerment for women, but it needs to find alternative sites Right, because of the way that the, the tradition has, has such been organized with male hierarchical um, organization. Right, so that women have always been an active part of shaping Catholic thought and practice, but have little been recognized. At times, the gendered hierarchy very actively keeping women's leadership and women's sexuality under male control. So my example then, the next example that I have, of women's alternative leadership is expressed in something like Teresa of Avila and other women who would have been leaders, right? leaders of women's uh, groups, women in, in uh, the convent setting. Um, Teresa of Avila and other mystics who would have been leaders in the convent. Right? And she claims the full fruits of a Catholic spiritual tradition of God's presence in dwelling, but she's very careful not to appear as if she has authority other than what is controlled by the hierarchy. So we see in this text 
um, that's really a, a classic of Catholic spiritual um, uh, visioning of this uh, medieval mystic. We see in this text her claiming of this ability for women to be, women and all people, to, be, um, to find God dwelling within them and the intimate union of the soul with God. But we also see her saying these things very carefully. So, so she says, let us see what becomes of this silkworm. For all that I've been saying about it is leading up to this. When it is in this state of prayer, quite dead to the world, it comes out like a little white butterfly. Oh, the greatness of God, that a soul should come out like this after being hidden in the greatness of God and closely united with him. So she has this beautiful, um, throughout Interior Castle, this beautiful sense of, of turning inward and really finding God within and the union of, of the soul and God in dwelling. But then she also says, we need to turn that outwards. What the Lord desires is works. If you see a sick woman to whom you can give some help, Never be affected by the fear that your devotion will suffer, but take pity on her. If she is in pain, you should feel pain too. If necessary, fast so that she may have your food, not so much for her sake as because you know it to be your Lord's will. That is true union with his will. Which is, she has lovely passages and lovely Christian direction of what it is to lead a spiritual life engaged in the world. But the opening of her text, um, she makes some disclaimers and she writes, these interior matters are so obscure to the mind that one with as little learning as I will be sure to have to say many superfluous and even irrelevant things in order to say a single one that is to the point. The reader must have patience with me as I have with myself when writing about these things of which I know nothing. In the landscape of the Inquisition, when this woman was claiming authority outside the hierarchy of the church, Right? I can't read this any other way than a rhetorical device to say, oh, any, anything you find at fault with me isn't, you know, don't, don't hold me responsible quite. And yet her writing is, is so very deep with its spiritual uh, vision and also its attention to, to action. So if I were telling her story in 15 minutes, um, I've jumped from the first century to the 15th, and then I would fast forward to the 20th century when women uh, gained access to education and theological education. So the access to secular education then led the way for access to theological education, which was a game changer for Catholic women. Right? So that in the 70s, you see women, Catholic women being trained in Catholic theology. And for the first time then, uh, they can really be recognized as authorities, and they can be writing right, and contributing to the Catholic theological tradition. Um, so since that time, in the, Catholic, in the Catholic Church, we've had this tremendous uh, movement in the last 40 years of Catholic feminist theologians um, really writing and really being widely disseminated and being widely read. Um, and so the last piece that I have is from a, uh, a group of women, uh, a group of feminist theologians, right, who were, have been part of a lecture series held at St. Mary's in Indiana. Um, and the lecture series has been, over the last 25 years, on Catholic feminist theological developments and their writing, etc. Um, and they represent both the, 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 the strides that have been made in Catholic feminist theology, but they also, in their message of hope, um, show that there's still a tension within, for women within the Catholic Church. Because they write, in the heart of, uh, sorry, in the tradition of Sister Madeleva Wolf, we 15 Madeleva lecturers have been invited to speak a message of hope and courage to women in the church. Why is it that we need both hope and courage? Reflecting the diversity of gifts bestowed on us by the Spirit, we speak from our particular experiences and vocations, yet share in a universal vision that is faithful to our Catholic tradition. To women in ministry and theological studies, we say, reimagine what it means to be the whole body of Christ. And this part, I think, is important. The way things are now is not the design of God. <laughs> to young women looking for models of prophetic leadership, we say, walk with us as we seek to follow the way of Jesus Christ, who inspires our hope and guides our concerns. The Spirit calls us to a gospel feminism that respects the human dignity of all and who inspires us to be faithful disciples, to stay in the struggle, to overcome oppression of all kinds, whether based on gender, sexual orientation, race, or class. To women tempted by, by the demons of despair or indifference, 
We, we say, reimagine what it means to be a fully human being made in the image of God and to live and speak this truth in our daily life. To women who suffer the cost of discipleship, we say, you are not alone. To the young women of the church, we say, carry, for the co- carry forward the cause of gospel feminism. We will be with you along the way, sharing what we have learned about the freedom, joy, and power of contemplative intimacy with God. We ask you to join us into, in a commitment to far-reaching transformation of church and society in nonviolent ways. So I think that we read in that, yes, both a message of hope, right, this sense that Catholic women have been and continue to be transforming the church, but the need for courage because of the work of transformation that still needs to be done so that women can be uh, recognized as full participants and equal members of the tradition. Not too bad, but 15. Well, Janine did a terrific job of keeping to our, our time limit, and I'm going to try to do as well. It's funny, at the beginning of her talk, she said when she thought about speaking about Christian women from ancient times to the present, you said you found the task daunting. That was exactly the word that I <laughs> thought of when I thought about talking about Jewish women from ancient times, if you will, until the present. And so, like Janine, what I've done is chosen a number of sources, which you have before you, which certainly are not comprehensive. There's going to be quite a lot that we're not going to get to cover in our remarks this evening. But I think taken as a whole, they do offer insight into some of the many religious roles that have been occupied by Jewish women. You may notice that the earliest source that I have here is from the sixth century of the Common Era, or what Christians call AD. Now, since Jewish history dates back almost 4,000 years to God's call to the biblical Abraham and his wife Sarah, some of you, especially those of you who are Jewish, may be surprised that my earliest source on this handout only dates back 1,500 years. It's a source from the Babylonian Talmud. On one foot, as Jews say, the Babylonian Talmud is an early compendium of Jewish law, made up of the earliest corpus of Jewish law, the Mishnah, a text which was edited around 200 of the Common Era, and then several hundred years of commentary and elaboration on the Mishnah called the Gemara. Now, although Judaism's teachings are based on the teachings of the Hebrew Bible, and specifically the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, what Jews know as the Torah. One of the things I do want to say, even though I don't have a lot of time, uh, is that Judaism, as it has been understood and lived for the last 2,000 years, has largely been a rabbinic creation. Hence my beginning with rabbinic sources and not the Hebrew Bible. That is, the Hebrew Bible tells us about the religion of the ancient Israelites, but Israelite religion is not the same as Judaism. That is, Judaism is rooted in the rabbinic understanding of those commandments, which, if you count them up, supposedly there are 613 thou shalt and thou shalt nots from the beginning of Genesis through Deuteronomy. But most of those commandments beg need explanation. And so it isn't just biblical commandments, but it's the rabbinic understanding of what those commandments say that make up what has been known and still is known as Judaism. Now in terms of the roles of men and women, let me just say before we look at the first sources, is that the rabbis understood, based on their readings of Genesis 1 and 2, that although men and women were created equally by God, that men and women are different by nature. And that understanding of what the rabbis see as an innate difference between men and women will shape the development of Jewish law. That is, in Judaism, gender matters. The rabbinic sages believe that as humans, we are not only created in the spiritual image of God, but that all human beings are embodied persons. And that what God wants us to do really does depend to some extent on whether or not one is a man or one is a woman. 
So very briefly, the rabbis understood Genesis 2, it is not good to be alone. Uh, it is not good for man to be alone. The rabbis interpret this, that men and women were created by God to be complements to one another. That essentially marriage is what completes or fulfills both men and women. And that there's this image of people who are not married, certainly Jewish people who are not married, as in some ways not being full human beings. Fast forward, again, the first few centuries of the Common Era, and what you find in early rabbinic literature is the codification of gender identity. So it's not just that men and women are different by nature, but the rabbis make this huge jump and say that women, because Eve, if you want to take this literally, because Eve or the first woman was created from Adam's side or Adam's rib, because she was created from a part of Adam that was hidden, women therefore are private persons, men are more public persons, and therefore in terms of the 613 commandments, the religious domain of men is primarily the public sphere of religious life, and the primary domain, religious domain of women is the home. Okay, so having said all that, we can now look at the Babylonian Talmud. And there is so much in the Babylonian Talmud, as in all of the different corpuses of Jewish law on the roles of men and women, but I picked this one out. Uh, you can see it's here, it's from a tractate called Kedushin. All positive commandments, meaning the thou shalt, all positive commandments, or in Hebrew mitzvot, which are time bound, that is, those positive commandments that have to be performed at a certain time, men are obligated and women are exempt. But all positive commandments, which are not time bound, are binding upon both men and women. All negative commandments, whether time bound or not time bound, are binding upon both men and women. And then in the Gemara, the rabbis go on to ask themselves, well, what are some examples? What are the time-bound positive commandments? And here they cite a number of them. Dwelling in the sukkah. It's actually a biblical commandment to dwell in this hut or sukkah for seven days. The rabbis understand that to be incumbent only upon men because, again, it has to be done at a certain time of the year. Shaking the lulav which also is associated with Sukkot, that's the palm branch, and actually shaking the lulav refers to the palm, the myrtle, and the willow, which are shaken together with a citrus fruit called an etrog. Hearing the sound of the shofar, so at Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, and on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, the shofar is blown because that is a commandment, a positive commandment, that happens at a certain time, women are exempt from hearing the shofar. Wearing the fringes, that refers to the biblical command to wear a four-cornered garment with fringes. And in rabbinic parlance, that basically means wearing a prayer shawl or a talit during prayer. And last, wrapping phylacteries, or in Hebrew, tefillin, the leather straps, that have within, on the arm and on the forehead, that have attached to them little boxes that inside have different teachings from the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, and why are women exempt from that? Because as the text goes on to say, this is what men do during morning prayer. So again, it's a time-bound positive commandment. And then the rabbis say, now is this a general principle? In other words, can we say as a general principle that of the 248 positive commandments, those which have to be performed at a certain time are not incumbent upon women? Can we say that of the 365 negative commandments, all are equally incumbent upon men and women? And now again, the rabbis answer their own question. They say, but unleavened bread, the eating of matzah, during the seven, or outside of Israel, the eight days of Passover. That is incumbent on women. Rejoicing on holidays. In other words, women might not be obligated to dwell in the sukkah or to shake the lulav, but they are still obligated to, to celebrate the holidays, including Sukkot, even though these are time-bound positive commandments. And they also say women are obligated to assemble. That is, they are obligated to actually hear the Torah read 
when it is read publicly three times a week. And they agree that these are positive commandments or mitzvot which are time bound and yet incumbent upon women. Or if I had had the space on this two page handout, I would have added the end of this discussion where Rabbi Eliezer, a very famous second century rabbi, basically concludes from this discussion that therefore one should be wary of all general principles and really it isn't helpful even to say, set out the general principles to begin with. Because there's so many exceptions that in the end it isn't all that helpful. Now, continuing here in the Babylonian Talmud in a different tractate called Barachot, which is the second source I gave you, first from the Mishnah, this earliest corpus of Jewish law, the Mishnah says women, slaves, and minors are exempt from reciting the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, which is a central prayer of Jewish public worship that is said at certain times in certain worship services. And the Mishnah goes on that women like slaves and minors, are exempt from putting on these phylacteries or tefillin. But, they say, they are subject to the obligation of prayer, which for a contemporary Jewish feminist, from the most liberal to orthodox feminist, is really very much up for discussion. In other words, clearly women are obligated to pray, but that can they fulfill that obligation by praying privately? <coughs> Or, in fact, does the Talmud tell us, or here the Mishnah does it say, that women, in fact, are obligated to be at some services, even though they don't necessarily have to be there when the Shema is being recited. They also say in the Mishnah that women are obligated to put up a mezuzah, which is the parchment containing words from the Torah that is put on the doorposts of one's house. And interestingly, the rabbis of the Mishnah say that women are also obligated to recite what in Hebrew is the Birkat Hamazon, the grace after meals, even though this is clearly a positive time-bound commandment. And if women were busy doing the dishes and were in the kitchen, then they couldn't possibly do the Birkat Hamazon. So again, they just come out with this. Now the Gemara will comment on it, and the Gemara says that they are exempt from the Shema is self-evident because again, it's a positive commandment bound by time. They say they are subject to the obligation of prayer. Why? Because it is a supplication for mercy. So here the Talmud is saying that women are obligated to pray, but again, the question is when and in what manner. Now here I jump, just as Janine jumped, now I'm gonna jump uh, about a thousand years. Uh, what happens in the late Middle Ages is that an entire genre of prayer develops for women. Many of these texts are by women. They are among the earliest sources that we have of Jewish women's spirituality. Because it does seem that women did pray throughout the Middle Ages, and that by and large women did not go to synagogue. Or if they went to synagogue, the prayer service may well have been inaccessible to them, since it's unknown how many Jewish women throughout the Middle Ages actually knew Hebrew. As a result, this whole genre of prayers developed, again, largely for women, mostly by women, prayers which were written in the vernacular. So we have such prayers in Yiddish, I've seen them in German, I've seen them in French, I've seen them in English. And these prayers are supplicatory prayers, which scholars often class together using the Yiddish word tichinus. A tichina is simply a supplicatory prayer. And I've chosen this one translated by Chava Weisler because in my first edition of Four Centuries of Jewish Women's Spirituality, it is by far the shortest source that I've found. <laughs> but I have to tell you also, I actually love this Tachina. And if we had more time, I could go into it in greater depth. Uh, this is called On Putting the Sabbath Loaf into the Oven. The rabbis say that in addition to the 613 commandments, there are three special commandments which God gave to women. One of them is lighting the Sabbath lights and saying a blessing just before the Sabbath begins. Another has to do with the laws of menstrual purity, which are rooted in the Bible, but the rabbis expand them. And the third is baking challah, bread, in preparation for the Sabbath in a ritually prescribed way. That is, you don't just break bake bread. Challah is a yeast bread that rises twice, and before the woman puts it into the oven, she takes off a piece of that dough and throws it into 
the oven. The oven is already lit and she burns that piece of dough and then she puts the entire challah into the oven. And you know, those of you who are Jewish who buy um, frozen yogurt, a uh, yogurt, frozen challah, sorry. I buy frozen yogurt, not frozen challah. I buy bought challah. But if you look at the boxes, it will say that this has, you know, the dough has already been taken out and it's been burned. Uh, so this is by an anonymous Jewish woman, woman written in 1648. And I actually find this prayer quite extraordinary. She says, this the woman says when she puts the Sabbath loaf into the oven. Lord of all the world, in your hand is all blessing. I come now to revere your holiness, and I pray you to bestow your blessing on the baked goods. Send an angel to guard the baking so that all will be well baked, will rise nicely, and will not burn, to honor the holy Sabbath, which you have chosen so that Israel, your children, can rest thereon and over which one recites the holy blessing as you bless the dough of Sarah and Rebecca, our mothers. My Lord God, listen to my voice. You are the God who hears the voices of those who call to you with the whole heart. May you be raised to eternity. When I first read this Tachina about 10 years ago, you know, I was used to hearing male rabbis say that the whole idea of calling God, not just the God of our fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, but also inserting into the prayer book God as the God of our mothers, the God of Sarah, the God of Rebecca, the God of Rachel, and the God of Leah. Um, and seeing, you know, hearing male rabbis say, well, that's just a femi 20th century feminist mm. creation. Mm. It turns out that at least as early as the 17th century, Jewish women were primarily identifying God as the God of our mothers. Because for Jewish women, traditionally religious Jewish women, that only reinforced to them that they too are members of the covenant between God and the Jewish people. Now, why does this particular woman only say Sarah and, Be and Rebecca? Chava Weisler speculates that maybe this woman's name was Sarah and Rebecca. Could have been Sarah Rebecca Horowitz or somebody else. Or maybe her mother and her grandmother were named Sarah and Rebecca. Many Tachinas name all four mothers of Israel. And what's noteworthy about this, and I have to really now speed up so I can get to the end, but I will say what's really noteworthy about this Tukhina, like all Tukhinas that I've read, is that the prayers of the synagogue are we prayers. That is, an individual doesn't pray to God as an individual I, but all of our prayers, God and God of our fathers, our God, mm -hmm. right? We pray as a whole, as a group, all of the tachinas are written in the I. They are written in the individual. So that this woman is offering this particular prayer to God, but she's saying it on her behalf, not on behalf of the entire Jewish people or even her congregation. This tachina, like all tachinas I've read, is also very much spontaneous and tied to the realities of everyday life. It took a Catholic student of mine at Fairfield to point out to me that if somebody is baking bread, and those of you who bake bread know that when you put a bread into the oven, you hold the pan like this with both hands and you put it into the oven. So this student said to me, if this woman is actually putting a pan, a Sabbath loaf into the oven, and she's using both hands to do that, how can she possibly sit and read this published prayer? And she's absolutely right. I think these were meant to inspire Jewish women to write prayers of their own. I should tell you, why did Jewish women take off that little piece of dough and put it into the oven? It seems that in doing that, consciously or unconsciously, they replicate the priests who lived in Jerusalem, who were in Jerusalem when the first and second temple was standing, and offered burnt sacrifices or burnt offerings mm -hmm. to God. So in fact, as Jewish women would say in the 19th century, uh, that by baking challah in this ritually prescribed way, Jewish women, and here's a 19th century phrase, actually become priestesses of the home altar. That is, they are standing in, in fact, for the priests in Jerusalem when the temple stood. Mm -hmm. Now, by the 19th century, there are many new ways in which Jewish women are able to express themselves in the public sphere of religious life. Included among them is education. The first Jewish Sunday school in America was founded by Rebecca Gratz in Philadelphia in 1838. Jewish women became involved either formally or informally in social work. Jewish women helped the needy and the poor in their communities. 
not just the Jewish community, but the larger communities in which they lived. Uh, and Jewish women began to form Jewish women's organizations. Among my favorite is the National Council of Jewish Women, founded in 1893 as the first Jewish women's organization founded independently of any male organization. That is, it wasn't a sisterhood of the synagogue. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like there's B'nai B'rith and then B'nai B'rith Women was created. There's the National Council of Jewish Women, and I really, I could talk for an hour on NCJW, so I won't, but it was founded in response to the fact that in 1893 there was a World's Fair in Chicago, there was a parliament of religions, and all of the major religious traditions in America were offered space to get up and have different speakers, and, uh, and it turns out that Judaism, like other religions in America, was given what I'll call a tent. They didn't call it a tent, but it in fact was a tent. Uh, and a Jewish woman who was a member of Reform the Reformed Synagogue Sinai Temple, a woman by the name of Hannah Greenbaum Solomon, recalls in one of her memoirs that she went to the organizers of the Jewish tent and she said, excuse me, but what Jewish women are going to be in the program? And as she reported it, this man said to her, well, Mrs. Solomon, there are no Jewish women who will be speakers, but you are invited to arrange the chairs. <laughs> And in response to that, Hannah Greenbaum Solomon organized her own Jewish women's tent. And so it was that in 1893, Judaism was the only religion at the World's Fair that actually had two different Jewish uh, tents. And as a result of that, the National Council of Jewish Women was formed. And among their committees was their Committee on Religious Schools, where a Jewish educator and social worker, a very prominent New Yorker by the name of Julia Richmond, the first Jew, male or female, to become district superintendent of the New York City school systems. Uh, Julia Richmond was chair of their religious school committee, and I find this report that she gave in 1896 to members of National Council to be extraordinary. She said, I claim for the work of the National Council of Jewish Women's Committee on Religious Schools, not only the key to the permanent usefulness of the Council of Jewish Women, but the key to the permanence of all true, earnest, spiritual American Judaism. In most cities, the rabbis are willing, and most often more than willing, to cooperate with our committee to better the work in our religious schools. In a few, only a very few instances, it has been reported to me that this cooperation of the rabbis has been withheld. May I say right here that only two causes could have produced such a result. Either are women with more zeal than tact have offended the rabbi or made unreasonable demands, or the rabbi is blind to the interest of our church. Very strange that she says church, that was not common in the time. And is foolishly belittling his influence and endangering his own success. I mean, you want to talk about confidence, right? So she's saying if the rabbis don't listen to us, they're foolish because they need us in order to be influential in their congregations. Only with the aid of our rabbis can the women hope to improve our religious schools. Only with the aid of our women can the rabbis hope to gain real influence over their flocks. That is, the women make sure that their husbands and children come to synagogue, and the rabbis can't do without them. She said, I would have you teach our little ones true Judaism, first God. Baby minds cannot, of course, grasp its significance, but make them feel the presence of God. Take your children to the religious school at a very early age. Select for them a teacher who loves little ones and who loves God. What do these babies care about Adam and Eve or the order of creation? Introduce them to the wonders of plant and animal life. Show them God in the bursting seed, in the budding flower, in the bird producing egg, the glorious sunshine. Let them see God and learn to love him for his blessings in which they share. Let them be made to feel that God means protection that to him they owe love and respect and gratitude and loyalty. Love of God, confidence in God, fear not of God, but of God's disapproval. These are the steps by which to develop the feeling of moral obligation, first to the world and then to Judaism. Mm. So I want to end with part of a talk that was given by Rabbi Amy Eilberg. One of the major differences today between Judaism and Catholicism is that to the left of Orthodoxy, women have been ordained as rabbis since 1972, and today they're 
there could well be a thousand women uh, who are rabbis. Women also have become cantors since 1975. Uh, Amy Alberg was the first woman to be ordained as a conservative rabbi. Uh, her ordination took place in 1985. And she was asked on the 25th anniversary of her, of her ordination to speak about what it had meant to her to have become a rabbi. And here's what she wrote, and then it became part of an article in the Jewish Forward on May 5th, 2010. She said, 25 years ago when I received my rabbinic ordination from the Jewish Theological Seminary, I became the first woman ordained in the conservative movement. In the ensuing 25 years, the ranks of women rabbis in the conservative movement's rabbinical assembly have swelled to more than 250 today. And again, there are many more than that today. Plus, there are more than twice that number of reform and reconstructionist uh, women who are rabbis. Conservative women rabbis have contributed in countless ways. We have fashioned new rituals for moments unique to a woman's life cycle and created feminist theology and textual interpretation. We've been pioneers in areas such as chaplaincy, healing, social justice, and peacemaking work. We have taught Torah, comforted the bereaved, welcomed Jews by choice, and labored at the sacred work of building community. At times, we have simply been rabbis. At other times, we have brought to our work particular gifts and sensibilities as Jewish women, helping to broaden the minds and open the hearts of the people we had the privilege to serve contributing to our people's dialogue with Torah and with God. Surely many challenges remain. The so-called stained glass ceiling remains firmly in place, although a handful of women have been called to lead large congregations of solo rabbis. The rabbinical assembly that is the, uh, the Rabbinical Association of Conservative Rabbis, their comprehensive 2004 study on gender and the career of conservative rabbis demonstrated that women rabbis continue to suffer significant discrimination in the workplace, including lower pay, challenges to their authority and legitimacy, and the usual flow of disrespectful and foolish remarks. Still, as I ponder the 25 years since my ordination at JTS, I am awed that we have collectively come as far as we have. For younger conservative Jews, as I'm adding, for reform and reconstructionist Jews, the denial of full equality to women is now inconceivable. And even in the Orthodox world, they are actively wrestling with the question of women's ordination. So thank you. Thank you. So we have um, our umbrella title for this series, as we know, is Shared Roots. And on a rather somber note, we have very deep shared roots in, in patriarchy and, and problems of oppression, as your answers describe. So what can you tell us about what Jewish and Catholic women have done, what they have done, and what they are doing to transform their religious communities? Yeah, I can start by saying, um, many years ago, one of the first women to be ordained as a reform rabbi, Laura Geller, who just retired but was a rabbi of a major congregation in Los Angeles. Um, Laura once gave an address, actually, to the Central Conference of American Rabbis, the rabbinic body of reform rabbis, in which she talked about growing up and having these imp important moments in her life that weren't celebrated by Judaism. You know, she said she was brought up to believe that in Judaism there's a blessing for everything. And yet she realized that when she first started to menstruate, there was no blessing for that. When she had her first child, there's no blessing actually for the mother who's giving birth. Uh, when she weaned her son, she realized that there was no blessing to be said in a ritual for the weaning of her child. And so Laura, in that extraordinary speech, said that women have come to realize that there is a Torah that was written down, that is the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, but she said there is also what she described as the Torah of our lives. Mm. That is teachings mm. that Jewish women learn from our own experiences. And out of that, Jewish women, primarily in America and Canada and Israel, but also I would say in other countries, especially in Western Europe, have created a whole slew of new rituals some of which have taken, some of which haven't. I mean, the thing about creating new rituals is for a very long time they seem very hokey. And then you kind of have to jump into them. But I would say among the rituals that have been uh, phenomenally successful is the ritual of formally and publicly celebrating the birth of a daughter, 
which today is just part of mainstream American and Canadian Jewish life. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea that traditionally, if a girl was born, her father would go to synagogue on the Shabbat after her birth and formally announce to the congregation her name, but the mother wouldn't necessarily be there. Even in Orthodox circles today, more and more families are choosing to have a ceremony or a ritual. It could be called a simchat bat, the celebration of a daughter, or it could be called almost anything. And the content, again, it can be up to the individual family, but I think that's something that, that has, really, has really taken hold. Um, there are other rituals which feminists have written, meant not just for women, but drawing on the experiences of women have brought them out to the community as a whole. So for example, former graduate student of mine, now a senior professor at Temple University, Laura Lovett, uh, was raped when she was a graduate student. And um, she and a close friend of hers, Rabbi uh, Sue Ann Wasserman, wrote a ritual of healing based on the fact that Laura had really been violated in this way. And their ritual of healing and using water, traditionally associated with the mikvah in Judaism and women, really is a very effective ritual for healing for anyone who has suffered pain in some way. Uh, I also think Jewish women have helped uh, transform the Jewish community by both creating new holidays and figuring out new ways to celebrate them. So one very brief example, the creation of an extra Seder, as if having two long ritual meals during Passover weren't enough. Uh, Jewish women in America have created women's seders. Mm. I remember going to the first one at the Jewish Theological Seminary. There were hundreds of us, and it was seen, men and women, and it was seen like a very radical thing to tell the story of oppression through the lens of women. Uh, I don't know about you out there who are Jewish women, but I know that you know, the first Seder after I've been cleaning my house and cooking and everything else, and I, I, I sit down at my table and I always say to myself, I am a slave in the land of Egypt. <laughs> uh, so the idea of having a women's Seder to celebrate Miriam and the other wonderful women who were important in the redemption of the Israelites, it's actually a wonderful thing. And I'll, I'll end here because there's so much more I could say, but I don't want to get to say too well, well, I want to, I want to um, take that idea of the experience of oppression and to really suggest that not women alone, but the witness that I see of Catholic women today who really inspire me has to do with those women who have come from out of their own experience of gender oppression and then look to the world at the various types of oppression and really say, well, this is the work that Christians need to be doing or this is the work that Catholics need to be doing. So, so on the Madaliva Manifesto, the, 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 the struggle to overcome oppression of all kinds, whether based on gender, Right, that comes out of this feminist theological heritage, sexual orientation, race or class. Um, so that where I see um, uh, that, that you mentioned, you mentioned the, the women religious being in the, in the news. Um, and, I, and, and I think that I found in the last two years, I had just spent a week with uh, a group of women religious the year before. And then the, uh, the uh, uh, so for those of you who maybe haven't heard about the women religious in the news, um, the United States Bishop Con Bishops Conference in communication with Rome did an investigation of the, women, of the leadership conference of women religious in this country and had some points that they um, you know, said were not in line with the way that they thought the, shir the church should be going, et cetera. And the, the leadership conference of women religious uh, heard that, right? And then they got on a bus, not all of them, right? But then the nuns on the bus took off and they said, yeah, and we're gonna keep doing this work that needs to be done. We're gonna keep knocking on doors of politicians who are shutting down programs for the poor. Uh, the women religious that I know are, are, are doing work in human trafficking. They're doing work in immigration. They're, they're engaging issues of racism. The, the feminist theologians that I know are the ones who are thinking together about the need for justice in so many different places. Um, there's a great volume, a, a, a new volume, something like Women, Wisdom, and Witness, a group of feminist Catholic theologians, and they're writing all the places where women are, right? Whether it's in the house or in the, the women's shelter or uh, in, in the court system or in education or in the classroom or in the UN. And they're really trying to do some of this thinking theologically 
not just from the received inherited tradition that women have traditionally been excluded from, but from the everyday lives of where people are found, um, and especially with attention to, to um, realities of oppression. Um, so, so uh, my experience as a Catholic woman in a church that um, that that had been a source of uh, despair and disappointment, right, was to see the women religious and to get to know more of the women religious and to say, that's the way I want to be Catholic. That's the tradition I want to carry on, right? And so I think that there is in that in that scrutiny, there's a new sense of from the women religious that said, yes, and this is what we need to be doing today. Um, so what have Jewish and Christian women learned from each other? What what can we do to support each other and um, move forward in our traditions on some of these really critical issues, and especially in these areas that you've identified of, of real pain and, 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 and oppression? Well, I think one thing that Jewish and Christian women, like women in other religious traditions, can learn from one another are strategies uh, with strategies to find those moments of hope uh, mm -hmm. within religious traditions that are clearly patriarchal. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one of the primary things that Judaism and Christianity, like Islam and other religions, have in common. These are patriarchal religious traditions. Uh, and, and it is hard to uncover the voices of women. Mm -hmm. So I think we can learn from one another how to remain in these patriarchal traditions and find meaning within those traditions and how best to affect change. Uh, I love that manifesto that you shared with us. This whole idea of not allowing other people to write us out mm. of our own religious tradition. You know, when women wanted to be conservative rabbis, some conservative Jews who were against the ordination of women said, well, why don't you become reform rabbis? Mm. You know, mm -hmm. and, and their answer was, well, we grew up in the conservative mm -hmm. movement. We mm -hmm. love the conservative mm -hmm. movement. We're not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I would say the same today with women who are orthodox. Those women who are orthodox who want to become rabbis, and I actually think I'm going to live to see orthodox women's ordination, because we're getting kind of close. I never thought I would live to see it being raised as a question, but we're long beyond that. Those women have been told time and time again, well, you're not really orthodox. Why don't you just become conservative and reformed Jews? And the refusal to do that, for me, really has been inspired by Catholic women who, again, have said to the church, you know, we're, we're fully Catholic, and we're not going to allow you to write us out of our own mm -hmm. religious communities. So I think, I think there's a lot of inspiration. I think also Jewish women, like Jewish men, have a, learn, have a lot to learn from Catholics in terms of theological thinking. Hmm. You know, Jews haven't been big on writing theology, and Jewish feminist theology, from its inception, was very influenced mm -hmm. by Christian feminist theology. Mm -hmm. And the texts that those of us who wrote Jewish feminist theology in the 70s and early 80s, over and over again, the people that we quoted would be people like Mary Daly, mm -hmm. who was then at Boston College, who, in terms of her notion of religious community, it's not a, an idea that most Jewish women share. But in terms of really talking about the implications of worshiping God as a father, a hierarchical male God who rules the universe, I would say that for Jewish women who are feminist theologians, that was really the beginning of Jewish feminist mm -hmm. theology. Mm -hmm. So I think there are things we've learned from one another, and I think we have so much more that we can do together and learn from one another. And I'm so glad that when Ellen started with strategy, she didn't look over at my sheet and no, say what I was no, going I'm to say. No, no, I didn't. I read that down. No. Because, because the thing that, that, that comes to mind immediately, that both from the, the beginnings of feminist theology and even in my own work, the practice practice of, of Midrash, where that's not, so the, the practice of, of finding something in the text and needing to, to write a new story about it out of the gaps is not part of my own Catholic heritage, um, but the Catholic feminist theologians that, that I was trained with, right, they were learning from their Jewish sisters that we need to write Midrash, right, and so Catholic feminist theologians were writing Midrash, and and really being empowered to tell a new set of stories. So not just being not written out, but also um, writing our own stories. Um, 
And I was flipping through my, the, the new book where I tried to learn across religious lines and I tried to do my own midrash with, with um, Eve and Adam and you know that, that, that I had been given the freedom by the Jewish feminist theologians that I knew that this was a perfectly legitimate theological strategy to envision things otherwise. And it's funny because the individual who inspired me to start writing midrash, which is the major way in which I write Jewish theology by creating interpretations of the text was really Catholic feminist theologian Elizabeth Schussler Fiorenza and her book In Memory of Her, which for me was one of the most influential books I've ever read. Mm -hmm. uh, talking about reading between the lines, about filling in stories that aren't there, about having women who appear in a text and then all of a sudden you hear that they died. Mm -hmm. And telling her story. I really learned that from Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that I think is important to, to put on the table for Catholic and Christian feminists is that we learned our own anti-Judaism by being in conversation with Jewish feminists, right? Where, where the first generation of Catholic theologians kind of said, oh, Jesus is a proto-feminist. We can set him over and against his, his own Jewish you know, male pa patriarchal. And their, and their Jewish feminist colleagues said, look what you're doing, right? Why, why do you need to do that? And so then pre creates a new opportunity to really say, well, how do I envision my story right, in a way that honors the story of my, of my sister, so to speak? Thank you so much. Thank you for your support of the programs. I thank Shalom TV for being here. And one last time, if we would thank Dr. Humansky and Hill Fletcher. Thank you so much. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.